introductory session, we describe the challenge for product managers today, designing compelling customer and user experiences in a world of rapidly changing technology and delivering those experiences with novel, unproven business models. This challenging environment has changed the types of problems product managers face from questions like, what is five plus five? The answer to which is of course 10, to questions like, what plus what equals 10, which has an infinite number of answers. And the better question might be, why 10? Why not 11 or nine? Many of us, raised in an era of standardized testing that rewards knowing that five plus five is 10, struggle in this more complex world. We are now dealing with what Horst Riddle and Melvin Weber, faculty in the College of Environmental Design at UC Berkeley, called wicked problems. These are problems that have many stakeholders, often with conflicting objectives, that have no single answer and that require probing and experimentation to understand. While Riddle and Weber focused on urban planning, think about how difficult it is to design a downtown park, for example, their work applies to your jobs as product managers as well. You work in a position characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Your competitors, in some cases, are also your customers. Your partners in creating your customers' experiences with you may not be aligned with your core experience design. And within your company, there may be many products and services that contribute to your customers' experience, and you have to figure out how to manage them all. These all make your job one of tackling wicked problems. What do wicked problems require? Consider a challenge given to a group of undergraduate entrepreneurship students at Stanford. Each team of five students was given $5 and two hours and told to go out and make as much money as possible. The teams were to return to class the following week and report on how much they had made with their $5 and two hours. Here are three examples of what they reported. One team used its $5 to purchase a used bicycle pump and set themselves up for two hours in the middle of the campus to pump up bicycle tires. They learned, by the way, partway through, that they were better off asking for donations than for pay. They returned with $65. A second team went to downtown Palo Alto, where there are many nice restaurants, and patrons sometimes wait in line for a table. The team offered to wait in line so that those patrons could go to a bar for a drink or go shopping instead of waiting. They returned to class with $255. What was different about their solution? They didn't use the $5. By taking the $5 out of their frame while brainstorming ideas, they were able to focus on higher value creating work that leveraged their time. They weren't limited by what they imagined they could use the $5 for. A third team thought about the problem for a bit and decided that the two minute time slot they had to present to the class might provide a focused opportunity for a company to market itself to the 90 bright young students in the class. And they sold their time slot to Cisco for $6,000, advertising time. They reframed the problem to be solved in a different way, ignoring the boundary conditions set by the $5 and two hours, and instead looking at the opportunity they had been presented. This simple exercise illustrates the importance of the choice of a frame for the problem to be solved. The frame you put around the problem you're helping your customers solve creates the boundary conditions within which you imagine alternative solutions. As product managers, it's critical that you're able to readily frame and reframe that problem space as you continue to learn about your customers and users, and that's where the five innovation capabilities come in. The five fundamental innovation capabilities are critical for product managers to develop in order to answer and then execute upon the four core questions. These capabilities are currently popularized in the design thinking and lean startup movements, but they have more academically grounded underpinnings. Learning theory, as captured, for example, by David Kolb's experiential learning theory, suggests that as we learn, 
we toggle between being engaged in concrete experiences and processing those experiences with abstract conceptualization. And we toggle between reflective observation or analysis work and active experimentation or synthesis work. This creates a two by two matrix, the left half of which focuses on asking why, framing the problem to be solved for your customer, and the right half of which focuses on asking how, coming up with a solution for your customer. Let's look at the four innovation capabilities framed by this matrix. In the lower left-hand quadrant, where reflective observation and concrete experience intersect, we observe and notice. We take in information in a wide variety of forms about the world around us. In the case of product managers, this is the quadrant in which you develop empathy for your customers and users, where you take in information about your competitors, and where you observe potential trends and discontinuities in the market. In the Sure example, this quadrant was represented by the summer spent observing and interviewing rock bands in both their practice and performance venues. The data collected in the Observe and Notice quadrant is messy data, audio or video recordings of customer interviews, artifacts from the customer's environment, big data yet to be analyzed. In the upper left-hand quadrant, where, ref where reflective observation and abstract conceptualization intersect, we make sense of that data, framing and reframing the problems to be solved for the customer. In the Sure case, this was the analysis that led to reframing the problem to be solved from hearing protection to achieving the rock musician's four desired outcomes, sound quality, control, mobility, portability, embodied in the notion of the personal stage monitor. Observing and noticing and framing and reframing are both on the why side of the learning process. They set up the problem to be solved on the how side. In the upper right-hand quadrant, we imagine and design, coming up with options for solving the newly framed customer problem. This requires carefully balancing divergent and convergent thinking, generating options for consideration, and then systematically assessing and selecting from among them. Sure engaged in this work as they generated a range of options for how the new device might best rest in one's ear for the ways in which the new device might be introduced to and evaluated by customers, and for the alternatives for communicating their new brand positioning. All this imagining and designing, however, is still being done in abstract conceptualization mode. It is a place where many organizations get stuck as they discuss and argue in sometimes interminable meetings about design choices that are best resolved by jumping back into the concrete world and testing them. Making things and experimenting with them is the focus of the fourth quadrant at the intersection of active experimentation and concrete experience. Sure, leveraged make and experiment work early in the project when they took their kludged devices out to test, and later in the project as they tried out device fit in a variety of ear shapes and settings. The fifth innovation capability we place in the center of the learning process as it facilitates the others and brings them to life. Mobilizing and executing gets a team involved in the innovation process and ultimately brings the newly designed customer experience to life. It relies heavily on the shared story that drives people throughout the organization to create elements of the customer experience that work together. The personal stage monitor story at Sure drove technology development, go-to-market strategy development, and brand development to develop, to develop an internally consistent customer experience for rock musicians. All of these are skills that you will have a chance to develop individually throughout this course. We will take a deep dive into how to observe your customers using both qualitative and quantitative methodologies, and how to get the data you gather to frame and reframe the value you're providing to those customers. Throughout the class, we will give you opportunities to practice your diverging skills as you come up with, for example, a range of options for developing your solutions for your customers. As you develop ideas for offerings you provide to your customers, we'll help you identify the biggest risks associated with those ideas and get creative about how to best experiment to evaluate those risks. And for mobilizing and executing, we'll address the critical elements of successful teaming as we have you evaluate how well your team performs today. 
The five innovation skills are not only individual skills, but also skills that your team can develop and that your organization may be working on developing as well. How well, for example, does your team know your customers? What resources do you have in your organization for observing and noticing customer behaviors? Does your organization have a shared understanding of the value you're providing to the customers? In other words, a clear and appropriate frame for the problem you're helping your customers solve. How is your team at knowing when it's engaged in divergent versus convergent thinking? Are you willing to try out new ideas, even ideas as simple as the outline of a presentation you might make, without finishing them first? What capabilities does your organization have for rapid prototyping and testing of ideas? Throughout the program, we'll give you opportunities to ask and answer some of these questions while developing your own innovation capabilities at the same time.